All right, here we go. It is episode 123 here on this Tuesday. It's a pocket. It's John Canzano from johncanzano.com. Ball face true, 750 the game. All brought to you by Zeke's Pizza. Visit Zeke's Pizza today for the best selection of local Northwest craft beers. John had a tough assignment this weekend. He was in Scottsdale, Arizona, covering the uh, Pac-12 tournament, the last Pac-12 tournament ever in baseball. How was it? It was kind of sad. I mean, there was a sadness around it because I think we've got we've gone through this right a number of times in the last year where it's like the last time, you know, Oregon State may play Washington. The last time Arizona is coming to play, uh, you know, against Oregon. You know, the, there were a lot of lasts during the college football season. And then we did it in basketball with the tournaments. But here came the last Pac-12 event. It's this baseball tournament and the last Pac-12 Network live broadcast after 9,000 broadcasts. So there was a little bit of a sadness about it. It was warm there, as Arizona will be. Um, I thought the final couple of games were really good. There were some underwhelming games that happened early. There was a uh, the merch the merch uh, stand inside the stadium <laughs> was blowing out all the Pac-12 gear. Like it, yeah, it, it puck. It was buy one get one on the T-shirts and. It, they had all these T-shirts from all of these events, all of these teams over the years that have, like, championship basketball events. There were softball T-shirts, like, things that had nothing to do with baseball. And then they did buy one, get one. And then on the last day, they went down to everything's five bucks. And so I did pick up a Pac-12 pennant with all 12 teams on it. You know that old felt pennant you probably have No, I love it. I wall? love the old felt pennant. Yeah, I got one of those. But um, there was just kind of it was just kind of sad. It kind of hits you in waves like that. And then I thought Roxy Bernstein did all right with his sign off on the Pac-12 network. I thought he he hammered that. That was a solid, uh, you know, home run there. And but just some sadness with some of the employees of the network yeah. who were working their last event and trying to figure out what they're going to do after. It's sad because you're sitting there, you're watching it. And first of all, like the championship game was just was just terrific. I mean, anytime you get a team that's winning it on a walk off and running home and a great, th it was a great throw too, great play at the plate and all that. And then just the, you know, they would show the history, you know, every time they'd come in and out of a commercial, Oh, there's a picture of Mark McGuire. There's Barry Bonds, you know, there's, you know, there's Randy Johnson, like all these guys. And you're like, My, how is this happening? Like, like you look back and all the great players and people that have come through this conference and you're like, how, how does it happen? Yeah, and, and you know we all know that it's it has nothing to do with baseball, it has nothing to do with basketball, nothing to do with any of these sports except for football and television. And the consolidation of football drove all of the madness. Um, TV networks they don't want all of the brands, they don't want all of the teams. They know what they do with the NFL and they do well. And so, yeah, these you know these conferences that have ceded control to commissioners who have ceded control to the TV networks. And so the how is and the why is. It had nothing to do with baseball. Baseball was not broken in the Pac-12. You look at the history that you mentioned, and even the teams that are going into the postseason this year with you know Oregon State and Arizona look really good. They both uh, both hosting, um, and then you you look at women's basketball. You say there's nothing wrong with what what happened in women's basketball in this conference. So there's just some just kind of somber, but also um, you know you had a lot of people saying you know okay now we have to pivot and. You know, there's no looking back for a lot of these teams. They got to figure out what they're going to do next. Yeah, it's just uh, it was sad and just all the way around. And, and you're right about Roxy. I thought Roxy did a great job of of signing off and in and, and really heartfelt messages. You know, a guy that was a longtime voice and, you know, face of the, of the network and uh, who grew up in the footprint and, you know, went to Cal and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, very sad. And, and what was also sad, and now you look back when he signed off, was that Friday, right? Yeah. Was the Friday Pac semifinals. Yeah. And his last thing was using a quote from Bill Walton. Yeah. And then two days later, Bill Walton uh, passes away and from colon cancer. Did you know he was sick? I knew when he didn't show up in Vegas for the Pac-12 tournament, something was wrong. Because he, he wanted to be there. And he had talked about wanting to be there. And he talked about, you know, he, he loved the conference. The, the Pac-12... You can talk about all the personalities of the Pac-12, Jackie Robinson, and you know a bunch of athletes who have come through in football and other sports, but, but there was nobody more Pac-12 than Bill Walton. He wanted to be there, and when he didn't show up in Vegas, 
I reached out to him. I did not hear back. Now, I did talk to Roxy, and Roxy said he had communicated with him a little bit. But Bill Walton went incredibly private at the end. I mean, the, I think it was really important to him that he spent time with his family and say the things that he needed to say to his loved ones. But, um, you know, I, I was struck, and I think a lot of other people were struck by the fact that the conference ends essentially on a Friday, mm. and Bill Walton doesn't make it, you know, 48 hours beyond that. And, you know, the conference and Bill Walton kind of went hand in hand. Well, there was there was no one on a on a national scale that was more proud of the conference and more adamant about how great the conference was. I mean, every year he'd be like, "I think we should get nine teams in. There should right. be nine teams going to the NCAA tournament." It, it's almost like it ended, and then he decided, you know, maybe it's time for me to go. Yeah, and, yeah, and it was, was, and he was mad. He was, you know, I went back. I I've interviewed him more than he's come on my show more than a dozen times, right? And came on three times in the last two years and his last two visits were largely railing on what happened, the greed, the uh, disappointment he had with UCLA. I asked him at one point of our last interview, you know, is this, when you talk about that disappointment, is it a heartbreak? Is it, is there a physical manifestation of what is happening? And he said, all of the above. Yes. All of the above. It, it broke his heart that the UCLA was looking to the Midwest for some kind of financial answer. And, and uh, you know, he made a comment. He said, you know, they're going to drag all of these non-revenue sports all over the country. He said, John, I've done that. I've, it's, it's, it's not a fun thing to do. And so, you know, he was not happy. He was not happy with UCLA. And frankly, I don't think UCLA was very happy that he was so outspoken about it. And, you know, I know they reached out to me after he, he wrote that missive and he gave it to me and he said, can you publish this on your website? I did. I heard from UCLA. They were, they were, they were looking to counterpoint his arguments. You know, he was the most visible, prominent booster, who was rallying support outside for, hey, let's unwind this. This isn't what we should be doing. And in the end, I, I'm left thinking about Walton and all he left. And his legacy really isn't all that about sports. You know, this was a guy who was very socially conscious. He cared about people. But Puck, I'll tell you something. He he gave us that I think we could all get learn from i went back and i was listening to all these interviews i'm gonna play some of them on my show but he was eternally upbeat and so much gratitude and constantly saying he was the luckiest and how gracious he was just such a gracious person and i think that joy that he had was infectious and you know i i've listened now to a couple hours of him talking and it's over and over again i'm the luckiest person i'm so lucky to be able to talk to you so on that note puck I feel blessed to be able to be on your show and talk to you. How about that? You're damn right you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. You know, I was I was thinking about it today, and it's – I never got to see him play. I mean, I've seen highlights of him. You know, I've read about him, how dominant he was at UCLA, and I've, that in that championship game where he scored 44 and missed one shot. And, and I read about and seen the highlights in, in Portland, having worked and lived in Portland. I know how what he means to that Blazer fan base. You know, I, you know, my recollection of him is at the end of his career, right? Is 86, 87 with the Celtics. And I'm 10 years old watching him play basketball. And I'd heard, you know, I mean, later I'd heard how good he was. But when I look back of the player I knew, I'm like, oh, he's the sixth man. And he's a pretty good player. Not realizing at that age just how good he, he truly was. And, and then there, and then his broadcasting career, John, is like a two part career. Because there's the NBA career with NBC, which is all of that kind of came together all at once for this perfect storm for the NBA. Because it's it's not only the NBC broadcast with him, Snapper Jones, Bob Costas, you, you sprinkle in a Doug Collins in there and Hannah Storm and Ahmad Rashad. Then it's the round ball rock with John Tesh. And then it's the emergence of Jordan, who has taken the mantle from, you know, Bird and Larry or for Bird and, and Magic. And it's created this just unbelievable product, right? So he was a part of that of me growing up watching him be an NBA broadcaster. But he wasn't what he was at ESPN and the Pac-12 Network. I mean, he was kind of funny, but he wasn't like slapstick funny like he is now. Yeah. He was more serious and kind of, you know, you know, more basketball oriented. So that has been fascinating to watch him as a broadcaster go from the NBA, NBC version to what 
most people now remember him is from ESPN and the Pac-12 Network. And I think early in his broadcasting career, now, again, this is a guy who overcame a horrific stutter as a kid. You know, he he couldn't speak, and he was uh, he was shy uh, to a fault. And he ended up, um, you know, he made the comment more than once that, you know, he's this funny-looking redhead kid with a big nose, and he ends up with a stutter, and he ends up becoming a broadcaster. And he's like, that that's the ultimate joke is on everyone else. But I think he he was the broadcaster that NBC wanted him to be early on. And then he became the broadcaster he wanted to be. And I think, you know, I had an interaction with him and Dr. Jack Ramsey in 2005 that was really interesting. I was covering the Spurs Pistons playoff series and I'm in San Antonio. I'm in Marriott on the Riverwalk and uh, it's early in the morning and I hear that Tommy boy, housekeeping, housekeeping, can I come in and fluff your pillow? Like, I can hear it outside in the hallway. It's not on my door, but it's like a couple doors down. I can hear somebody with a high-pitched voice doing that. And so I, you know, it's early. I open the door and I just peek my head out and it's Walton and he's in the hallway and he's knocking on Dr. Jack Ramsey's door trying to do the housekeeping thing. And he's got his hand over ne- over the peephole so Ramsey can't see out. And And he looked at me and he was just giggling and laughing. And I think if Bill Walton taught us anything on air in that second phase you talk about, it's d- let's stop taking ourselves so so damn seriously, especially in sports media and sports broadcasting. Right. It's supposed to be fun, damn it. Yeah, that I think, and people lose that all the time, right? It's we are in the you know Kevin Calabro used to always say this: we are in the fun and games business. <laughs> and I used to always, yeah, you damn right you are. And, and he had such he was just having fun. Yeah, and, and I know he wasn't for everyone. There was people you'd hear it all the time. Can we just get basketball analysis? Can we just <laughs> – I'd be like, okay, but really? Like, I don't really care sometimes what these guys say. I want to be entertained for the two-plus hours I'm watching a basketball game. And and he did that. You know, he did yeah. that for me. I mean, I, and I think he also did it for a lot of people. I don't think there's very many broadcasters that I could say I would tune in to see a game because they're on the call. Walton is a guy where if I'm flipping by and he's on the broadcast, I would stop. And it was because I was going to hear a story about him going to the hot springs with Steve Snapper Jones or riding his bicycle downtown Portland, uh, you know, to the championship parade. He lost his bicycle that day or he was going to tell, you know, he was always, he was going to do something that layered the broadcast. And it did drive some people crazy who were just there for the broadcast, but he was for me. He's not for everyone, but he was for me. He was for you, apparently, too. I got a, I got a story idea for you. You're the one who can handle this one. Okay. You need to get – who are the prominent, like, play-by-play partners for him? For, so, for me, it would be um, Dave Pash, Pash, Roxy. As Benetti used to do a bunch of games with him, and Ted Robinson, right? It's okay. those four? Yeah. You should, have, you should have them all, like, on a round table. Oh, that would be great. Be a pretty good story. I reached, I'd, to, I'd like, yeah, I reached out to I'd a couple like, of them. Yeah, I'd like to know: do they do they do a good job of playing it off, or were they ever at one point annoyed with him? Well, I'm sure they were annoyed. And then Walton had a w- little quirk too. He told me one time he didn't like to talk to them the day of the broadcast. He didn't want to be <laughs> in a pre-game talk. He didn't want to share thoughts. He Love didn't want to go into that broadcast with a preconceived notion of what he was going to say or what his partner was going to say. And it caused problems because the uh, the coaches who were involved in the games, for people who don't know, the coaches will generally do a call with the play-by-play and the analyst before a game. And they'll be on a video call or they'll do be on a conference call with them and then they'll kind of talk with them and it gives them, you know, they're contractually obligated to make that call from, through the league or through the conferences. But it gives the broadcasters some extra insight into what's going on in the games. Walton insisted that that interview be done separately. So Pash and Walton would be on separate calls, like with, you know, the coaches in the Pac-12 who were who were uh, coaching games. Dana Altman had to do that call twice. And so I'm sure the coaches didn't like it. But Walton's, and I think this is true, Walton maintained that it helped with the authenticity of the broadcast because the viewer was hearing his viewpoint for the first time and you were seeing him react to what Dave Pash or Ted Robinson or Roxy had to yeah. say it like it was real. And and I've been in on some of those meetings, like at FS one, I went and hosted a show one time. The whole thing is orchestrated. It's all the, the pre pregame 
meeting that they have with all the producers. Well, what are you going to say? Well, what are you going to say? Well, what about this topic? Everybody knows what everybody's going to say. So it's manufactured dissent and manufactured arguments. And Walton wasn't about that. He he just wanted to let it rip. Yeah, you see, I, I yeah, I'm with him 100. percent In all the years that I did radio, you know, when Jim and I were doing radio, just you know, recently, we'd never ever ever talk about what's yeah. going to happen on the show. We would know, like, hey, John's coming up today, right? Or here are the guests that are coming up today, but there were, there's no discussion of what we're talking about because it. You're right because then it like, well, if I know what you're going to say, then already I'm countering it. If you're there's going to be a counter in my head, I I want to hear it for the first time. Yeah. Right. I want to, I don't want to see the present before I open it up. Yeah. Even though I tried mind. to open up the presents when I was a kid, but I don't want to see it. I want to be surprised. That's what it's all about. It, it leads to a, an organic, you know, organic show and organic yeah. broadcast when you don't sit there and rehearse it. You can tell these shows that sit there and rehearse it yeah. and it's just nauseating. Now, for some reason, people love it though, John. I mean, they, yeah. they get a kick out of it and then and it, and they're wildly popular, but I, I just, it drives me up the wall. I understand why the producers do it because it creates an argument and they'll sift around the different topics. I'll go on the, you know, the one production meeting I was in on an FS1, Andy Roddick was on the panel, Gabe Kapler was on the panel, and it was me. And they were asking, they went through a variety of topics and they got to, you know, is LeBron a good or a bad leader at this point of his career? What <laughs> would you doing say? It. <laughs> and, and I was looking around going, you want me to tell you now? Like, I would react to what Gabe or Andy were going to say. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I, but they were really, the producers were hunting for topics that we would naturally disagree on. And, sure. And then saying, you know, they were kind of hamming it up a little bit. So I don't know. I like it better when it's organic. Like, you and I, we talk once a week. This is it. Let's go. What was the show called? It was, uh, Gosh, I don't. It was a round table. I don't even remember what it was, but I they vaguely brought, remember this. I have, I have the cue card they gave me. Or here are the topics we're going to talk about, and they handed it to me before, and I was like, great. But it, you know, it was designed to create arguments, and yeah. uh, you know, Kapler had not gone on to become manager of the Giants yet. Roddick was Roddick was a star, and he, I thought he was a really good guy, a good person to deal with. But you know, it was. Uh, they flew me in. They, you know, limousine to the set, and then uh, I'm sitting in the green room watching a baseball game with Frank Thomas. He's sitting like two seats away from me. <laughs> Frank Thomas. Yes. Yeah. I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever. And then they're like, well, what are you gonna say? How do you feel about this topic? And I'm like, you want to know now, or you want to know when we're on air? Yeah, yeah. But, I, I speaking of sitting there watching a baseball game, and you you detailed this in in your recap of, of from the Pac-12 tournament and and watching all everything. Um, uh, developer uh, down there in Scottsdale, you were sitting in the stands. You were watching it with Bob Thompson. I think there's yeah. a lot of people for people that don't know Bob Thompson's the the former uh, Fox uh, executive who you've had on your show a bunch of times. Yeah. You've written about him. He's been kind of your 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 piece that you use for TV when you're negotiating all the contracts and finding more information about TV deals with uh, with the Pac-12 specifically. I think there's a lot of people that like to be a fly on that wall. Oh. Just you two chit chatting in the stands it about was... the future of television it was fascinating and i sat I in the stands intentionally like the pac-12 asked me when i got to the stadium they said hey do you need a seat in the press box i said no 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 i'm gonna sit in the stands so i sat and i watched oregon state play uh in, you know an early game and then i stuck around for usc was playing uh, oregon in the second game and bob thompson came over to the stadium he lives not far from scottsdale and he sat with me and for people who don't know like he was dead solid perfect with the valuations for the Pac-12. He told me very early after UCLA and USC left, he said it's 30 million per school. That's what I would pay for them if I were at Fox. We come to find out ESPN offered 30. Um, I think if the Pac-12 had hired Bob Thompson to consult instead of the firm they went with, I think they would have ended up in a better position because I think from go, he would have adjusted their expectations and said, you're not worth 50 million. You better take this deal. There's no other money in the market. He was telling me things all along that that came true. I was writing about it. And so we sat there and we watched. And he's the perfect TV executive because he grew up in the Pac-12 footprint. He went to the University of Oregon. He has a real love for the conference, but he has an understanding of the business that is going on that is undermining all of this. Wow. And he's well aware of it and, you know, I just was peppering him. 
You know how you sit at a baseball game and you talk about nothing for two hours? I was peppering him during, during that talk. Well, what if this? Well, what if this? What if, you know, if you took Boise State, I would create a conference, a Pac-12 conference for the future. You know, how much media rights money could a conference that would include Stanford, Cal, Oregon State, Washington State, Boise State, you know, San Diego State. Okay, how much for those schools? And he'd come back with numbers at me. So it was, uh, it was just a it, really interesting talk. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of television and, and the future and all, all those things, what um, what was what did you make of some of the schedules that came out? Who was upset? Who was the most upset? Uh, let's go first with the Big Ten with the Friday games. Washington got two of them. Rutgers yeah. on the road and then at home against UCLA. Were they were they bothered? They had to play uh, more than once on a Friday night. Yeah, I think Oregon and Washington kind of were thinking and hoping that they had left those Friday night games in those short weeks in particular uh, behind, right? When they left the Pac-12. They're, Oregon and Washington are, are appearing more on a Friday night uh, this next season than they have in several years. And to, I asked Thompson about that, and he said, well, what did they think? They were going to think everyone thought they were going to play at 1230 on a Saturday. Uh, you know who's absent from those Friday night games. It's the Big Ten's traditional powers that are absent. And Shocker. You know, and I get it. You know, when Fox did what it did and took those four teams, it had Pacific time zone slots that it's got to fill. And it's also using Arizona and it's using Utah, you know, once each. And so I think there was some belly aching, obviously, uh, fan base. But I also think there's a strategic issue there as Oregon's got a game on a short week after the Ohio State game. You know, they've got they've got some obstacles that did not exist before the schedule came out. Now, I think Oregon's good enough to overcome it, but it still creates a wrinkle in their schedule. What do you what do you make of this? Is it just an internet thing, a Twitter thing? What's going on with Utah? Is there's there some smoke at all with Utah wanting to go to the ACC? No, I I just think Utah first of all, Utah was happy in the Pac-12. I talked to Utah's president, I talked to Utah's athletic director, they were happier than anybody to be in the right. Pac-12. And I think all along they were rooting that the Pac-12 would find a way to come up with a deal. I mean, the great irony being that Taylor Randall, the Utah president, was the one who initially suggested they were worth $50 million each. And that caused a problem. But uh, he wasn't alone in that room. Stanford's president was also saying, hey, I think we, I, he's right. I think we are worth $50 million. Uh, but I, I always think that, you know, the ultimate end game here as I talk to presidents and ADs, is that everybody's talking about what is it going to look like in three to five years? What's going to look like in 10 years? And the consensus that I keep getting is that we are going to see this massive sort of fracture with football breaking away. And maybe it's going to come in the wake of this antitrust litigation where the schools who are the haves are going to end up paying 20 to $30 million a year in revenue sharing. And the have nots are just going to say, hey, we can't pay that. You know, we're going to have to drop sports to do that. And so I do think you're going to have this breakaway. But I right now, I'm not making too much of what I'm hearing because who knows what's going to happen in the ACC? Who knows what the Big 12's reaction to the ACC implosion could be? And what about this infrastructure, that, this massive you know, pivot point that we're now right approaching? What's going to happen there, I think, is going to, is going to dramatically change thinking. And so I'm not making too much of, you know, does Utah want to go? Who would want to go to the okay. ACC at this point? You know, I, I, I don't I, see that as an attractive destination right now. Yeah, the uh, yeah, neither do I. Uh, I don't. It just I, I saw it. It caught my attention. Yeah. I think did they have to put out a statement today? I didn't see that yet. I haven't yeah, saw. I haven't seen okay. a statement. But I, I just wonder if they had to shoot it down that they're they're happy in the uh, in the Big Twelve. But I don't know. I mean, this uh, everything just moves so damn fast. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's crazy how how fast things move. But, but, but hey, here's what, the thing: like you I, know, if you're Oregon State and Washington State. I've heard this from more than one athletic director, it, power four athre, uh, athletic directors. They believe Oregon State and Washington State is better positioned than Stanford and Cal right now. And people say, well, Stanford and Cal are in a power four. And we go, okay, for now. But Stanford and Cal are, you know, attached through a grant of rights that will take, you know, effect in, uh, in July. Are, they're attached to the ACC. They don't have options. So if the ACC right. implodes, there could – you know, be a Pacific division that comes out of it. The, the ACC wants to put together. There could become a Pacific division that the big 12 wants to put together and Oregon state, Washington state at this point, you know, the, the, the 
the, the listening that I'm getting from those schools right now is that they feel like they're in not a bad spot relative to where they were a few months ago because they know they've got a TV deal, they've got a schedule. Now it just becomes about strategy and watching what happens with the ACC in particular. You and I last week when we, when we left off, we, we brought this, this topic up and then we said, well, let's table it to, to next week. I have a little bit more time. You, you wrote about this in your uh, mailbag, and there was a, a situation in the high school state track championships, a transgender athlete who uh, was born a male but competed as a female, correct? Correct. And in an event in track and field, ended up winning it over, and then a, a girl ends up finishing second. It created a bunch of a controversy. It created, you know, hard feelings probably on both sides, mixed emotions on both sides. And you wrote about at least in the mailbag, but then you went on the on the radio show and you made a whole like a show out of it, taking phone yeah. calls about it. How do we address it? What's what's the right thing to do? Like, how do we move forward with this? What 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 came out of that? And um and and then especially on the radio show because that's a tough one to do on the right. radio, right? Yeah, there's a lot of opinions on this one, and it can get a little dicey. Yeah, and and I'm not, you know, look, part of it probably, and you you have this as well. It, you know, if you've done 15 or 17 or 18 years of radio, you are now in a position where you know how to have that kind of conversation. You know, you're not if you're trying to do it in year two, you'll look around the studio and everybody's backing away from the mic because everybody's afraid to get fired. But sure. there's a way to have that conversation, and and I think it's an important one to have because it's a big issue, and it's not just an issue in the state of Oregon. It, there, it's an issue in the state of Washington. It's an issue other places where you have trans athletes who want to compete in sports. And my, you know, my position is pretty simple. Um, I think everybody should get to compete. But I don't think that it is competitively fair to have someone who is born biologically male competing against someone born biologically female in a 200 or a 400 meter race. Um, and so people say, well, what do you do? And I, it's pretty easy. Either you say, hey, you can compete in the boys division as a trans athlete, or we call the boys division an open division. Or we create a third division that is a trans division, and you can run in that division. But just, just like an open, an open yeah. invitational. Would you just do like, let's say, an open invitational for anyone? Yeah, I think you could because I think I, you know, where I eventually got after two hours of kind of, you know, part of the beauty of good radio when it's done, you know, in a way that is, if, you know, not just people flame throwing and torching yelling each other. and screaming at each yeah, other. Yeah. It, you know, you get ideas and you can crowdsource those ideas and you can test your yeah. opinions. And, and yeah. where I ended up was yes, create an open division trans athlete who is born biologically male can compete in the open division, uh, but cannot compete in the girls division. And, it, and the reality of that is that there's a competitive advantage there. And it, it became apparent in the 200 and it became apparent in the 400. And, and the, tra the, the transgender athlete won both the 200 no, and the 400? No, finished second in the 400. Second in the 400, second but won the 200. Second in the 400 by 0. .15 seconds. And the girl who won it, you know, ran a PR to win that race. And I, okay. I can guarantee you that she woke up that morning and said, I am not going to get beat today. And yeah. in, you know, in the... 200 it was you know for 100 there's a sophomore at at uh, local portland high school who was ahead for 170 meters and got passed in the last 30 meters and she should have been state champion and it was really sad at the event because normally this is a very joyous event with a lot of support and what happened was you know the trans athlete standing on the podium gets booed while getting the medal you know presentation and wow. So it, I don't think that kid deserved to get booed, but I think the system is broken. The OSAA, which is the, uh, you know, the governing body of high school sports in the state of Oregon, has basically dropped the turd in everybody's lap and said, hey, we, you know, we're just we're not going to we're not going to have an opinion on this. And trans athlete can compete where trans athlete identifies. And that's fine, except, you know, I think, you know, if you had the open division puck there, there was a case earlier this year that. The girl who won the 400 state championship competed in an open division, ran against boys, and, you know, did okay. But if that open division can capture anybody who wants to run, the point should be inclusion. Like, let's be inclusive. 
The point isn't to say, hey, if you are a trans athlete, you shouldn't compete at all. No, there's a place in this track meet for everybody, but trans athlete, biologically male, running in the girls 200, I am left thinking it's, you know, somebody who finished second should have been a state champion. How, how did she handle it? Um, did she do an interview at no, all? Has she talked no, about it? No, 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 didn't talk, but just uh, you could tell from the crowd. I mean, the trans athlete needed security from the hotel out. to the track and then back. Yeah. Uh, there were boos. It just became a big negative, and it didn't have to go down that way. But the uh, fact of the matter is, you know, not only the girl that finished second, not only did it take her day, the trans athlete gets booed. Uh, and then somebody who finished, who should have been in the race, was ninth, didn't get to run and didn't get to go to state. And, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm almost more interested in talking to that kid and going, hey, you know, how did your, how did your Saturday go? Because you yeah. should have been able to tell your kids someday that you competed in the state championship. But I didn't like the booze. I didn't like the uh, the lack of a position by the OSAA. And my hope is that you know, well, because they wanted to they yeah. wanted to be delicate with it, right? Sure. They don't want yeah. to offend anyone. But I think your idea of the open division is is really the the correct one. And I, and I know there's a lot of different opinions on this one. And when people listen to this and and watch it, they'll they'll have their own. And I would just say this: we have, I've experienced this with you know a couple of families that have gone through this. And you know, it, you don't you know, I don't never try to pry too much into their business. But I am always curious, like you know, how does it affect the family? How does it affect mom? How does it affect dad? And then I would always turn around and say, well. Like what would, cause everyone's got an opinion when ain't their own kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. When it's, when it's not your kid, everyone's got a hard line stance of how they feel. And I always try to answer something like that with what if it was my kid? Right. In both cases, how would I feel fuck, too? What if your kid is the trans athlete? What if your kid is the girl? Right. And that, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, I think you got to look at it and, and, you know, and I know someone's saying, well, that would never be my kid. Oh, okay. Well, I'm asking you to to just play around, play for a second. If it were your kid, and how would you feel? Yeah, and 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 for the other side too, how would you feel if you were the the parents of the of the girl? Yeah, and then how would you feel if you were the parents of of the of the trans athlete? So it was bad. Everybody I, lost. Everybody lost. You're right. Yeah, there was no winner, and no one and and people didn't need to lose. And yeah. you got to th like this is going to be more common, so they better start thinking about it. Yeah, there are two athletes in the state of Washington who are uh, trans athletes who were competing in the state competition. The difference in Oregon is it was a biologically born male who competed in the girls division. Right. And, you know, when you look at the times, if there was an open division, um, you know, that athlete would not have placed in state and probably wouldn't have made state with the times. Yeah. I mean, it, it's okay to say if, you know, the, the the bodies of a, of a male and a female are just going to be different. Yeah, and the strength and all of that is just going to it's it's just going to be different. And it's okay. It's it's not to take away from the athletes at all, and to say that that they can't compete. But it's just bigger, faster, stronger. That's just you know that's just the way things are. Um, and it does give an inherent advantage to that, especially when you're going to compete against other girls. It just is. I come back to the word fair. Was it fair? Right. Was what happened fair? And that's really what I was wrestling with as I started the sh radio show that Monday. And and I was like, no, it wasn't fair to the girl who finished second. It frankly, it wasn't fair to the trans kid who, you know, it got booed and, you know, humiliated and jeered at. And, you know, right. I'm trying to be sensitive to, you know, I keep coming back to like the word inclusion. And I think it's a word that gets thrown around a lot now. But I think there's a place in the competition for everybody to compete, for everybody to feel good about where they're competing. And then you let what happens on the court dictate who, who wins or what happens on the track. But the way it went down, I mean, the OSAA, to me, looks like it's begging for a lawsuit to, to help it determine what its position should be. And that should not be the position of any entity. Like, you have to go in going – this is our position, and here's the logic behind it. Instead, they just said, well, you know, we're, uh, we're not dealing with this. The, the Oregon Department of Education's position is mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, 
trans athletes should be included as they identify. And yeah, I, I just, I'm with you. Yeah. I just want, I want, I want kids from all, from all backgrounds, all sexes and anything, any, I, I, however you identify to have the ability to compete, compete and play sports. You know, you want more, more kids to play right? rather than, than less kids to play. All right. Let me, let me end on this one. Uh, you being a former baseball player, you can answer this yeah. now. Your kids, your younger kids aren't there yet. And your your older kids wouldn't have had it yet. But do you do you know the Game Changer uh, app? I'm aware of it. Yes. Okay, you're aware, aware of it, of right? The Game Changer app. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so every every baseball parent, softball parent knows what it is, and every baseball and softball parent knows that you don't want to be in charge of the Game Changer app. Okay. You no one ever <laughs> wants it. Like it, people will walk around. Hey, you want to do Game Changer today? And for people that don't know, it's just you're scoring the game, okay? You put the lineup in and you score the game. And you, you, there's so much going on, and you don't want people to talk to you because you need to be able to watch and score the mm-hmm. game. And everyone says, well, I can do it if you need me. And it, the if you need me means I don't want to do it. So this we had a tournament this week in four games, and I just I said, I'll, just, I'll do it. Fine. I'll do all of the games. I'll, I like doing it. I don't, I don't really like doing it, but <laughs> – I can score the game. I'll be fine. I can just, it keeps me engaged. And then I don't worry about like when little, you know, the 10 year olds up pitching and I, you know, start getting all like, God dang it. Get your elbow down. Get up on that back leg. You son of a bitch. If you don't start doing it, then we're not going to, you're not getting a treat after the game. So, but here I had, I had a ruling on, I had a, a kind of a question and I think I know what the right answer is, but I just, I think it's the coach of me that came out in it. So here's the situation. Okay. Uh, two outs in the end. I mean, it doesn't really matter how many outs are, but uh, no runners on. Nobody on. So there is a routine infield pop fly. Okay, nobody's routine. on base. Nobody's on base. All right. What? How old are the kids? And uh, ten. Okay, routine. Okay, routine is the key word there. Okay. I mean, it's club baseball. I'm playing umpire here. Okay. So- okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's. I think it's routine. All right. And it, the ball, ultimately, it's between the th- shortstop and the second baseman, but it's about two feet to the short, to the shortstop side, okay. past second base. Yep. Okay. They, it's hit not fairly high. It's not sunny. It's nothing, no weather. Sun doesn't factor into this. Mm-hmm. And they both look at each other as the ball's hitting the air. And they're like, I don't know. Are you going to get it? I don't know if I'm going to get it. Anyways, the, the point is they both stayed in their spots. Mm-hmm. No one moved. Okay. Where's the third, to get ba- the ball. third baseman didn't get there either. Third baseman okay. didn't do it. Pitcher didn't do okay. it. They just all looked at and just sat there. Okay. No one called it out. Mine, my, my, I got it. I got it. I got it. None of that. And the ball bounces probably three feet, four feet from the shortstop. Okay. I gave the shortstop an error. Hmm. Not a hit. Okay. Now, the... Didn't make a play on the ball. So technically didn't go off his glove. But my ruling as the scorekeep game changer president was, I don't know, he should have made the play. Yeah. But now I'm hearing from people and they're like, no, you should have given a hit. And now I'm I now I'm gonna go back and change it, I think. Ten year old routine should have been an out. Um, I'm trying to think what you, what would you have done if the ball had landed between the center fielder and the left fielder the same way? Would you have called that a hit or would you have said, uh, well, if they both, it's an error, it's yeah. an error, puck, it's an error. If they both state, if they both, if the center fielder and, and, and left fielder never moved yeah. or they're going after the ball, they never moved. Like if they're going after the ball and it lands, that's a hit. No, but if they just stayed moved. there, I should have know. been caught. Don't move. It lands. I don't know. I just, I just. Yeah, I mean, I don't they're know. ten though. I think, I think, I would consider it an factor error. In the 10 years I would old. consider okay. it an error, but I have a hard time if you're under twelve giving you an error okay. because I'm a nice human being. Let's channel your inner Bill Walton here and just say that was okay. a line drive in the scorebook. And I think it, you know what was factored into the decision because it was my son pitching. Oh, well, in that case, that's an error. <laughs> You left that. You left that out. I was no. I snuck that in there at the end. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go change. Uh, it. I didn't hear from anyone, so but the I don't opposing think they were the team. Same does that. that cost that kid a hit, or did what did their scorekeeper do? 
Uh, you know what? I should go back and l- go I didn't go back and look. I should go back and look. They probably gave him a hit. Go back and look. If they gave an error, then you're you're justified. You got it. Yeah. There's two scorekeepers. I was probably I was probably stadium. swayed. You know. I am. I'm going to the game tonight. I'm going to ask the official scorekeeper for the Mariners. What yeah. What would you have done if J.P. Crawford and Josh oh. Rojas stood there and let the ball drop? <laughs> did the ball when there? the ball dropped? Yeah. Did it roll? towards the outfield no it just like dead it just stopped uh, okay so here's a here's a trivia question let's say the ball had hit and went backwards and rolled foul fair or foul <laughs> oh foul right if, if it doesn't pass the base but you have to tell me like where is the line in your league cuz i don't know at 10 where's the pitching Oh so run? if it doesn't if it if it if it passes the baseline and rolls back it's fair but if it doesn't yeah. pass the baseline it it rolls foul, it's foul? It's foul. Oh really? That's why a bunt rolling foul before the baseline is, you know. Yeah yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'd love to see that happen. Yeah, I'm that sure would it be has. phenomenal. I'm sure it has happened somewhere. <laughs> Guaranteed. Did you see the uh, where was that real quick? I don't know if it was a high school game or a small college. Uh, did you see where the ball – did you see this on Twitter? Yeah. The guy hit it to the outfield and made it all around for an inside the park home run because no one was covering the base. Yeah. No, no, actually, he got tagged out at home. <laughs> by the center fielder, so, right? By the yeah. center – I think it was the center field who ran, ran all, all the, the way, way in because no one was covering second, yeah. then no one covered third, and then the catcher left home to cover third, and then the guy ran all the way in. The dude's running around the bases and then tagged him out at home. Yeah. That's phenomenal. Yeah. That's great hustle. Uh, I love it. Uh, yeah, You can watch a baseball game. You'll see something new every time you watch a game. That's yeah. the beauty. Well, of thanks, Tim Kirchin. That was a Tim Kirchin right there. Yep. You know, you never know what you're going to see at the ball game. All right, there he is, John Canzano, johncanzano.com, bald face true, 750 the game. It's all brought to you by Zeke's Pizza, zekespizza.com. What do you got coming up on the website? What do you got coming up on the radio well, show? Uh, we're we're going to deal with Bill Walton on today's show. And um, okay. I went back and I pulled like 18 audio cuts. Not not hard to get big chunky cuts with Bill Walton. No. So we're going to do a retrospective there. And then uh, obviously – uh, we got some postseason baseball coming up, and I- I'm really starting to look ahead towards the football seasons. Not, you know, Oregon State, Washington State, Big Ten, Big Twelve, ACC. Uh, more ahead on that. Okay, there he is, JohnCanzano.com. Go check it out. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Thanks John. Buck.